Chapter 14, The End of Days. Mankind's recollection of landmark events in its past, legends or myths to most historians, include tales deemed universal in that they have been part of the culture or religious heritage of peoples all over the earth. Tales of a human couple, of a deluge, or of gods who came from the heavens belong to that category. So do tales of the gods' departure back to the heavens. Of particular interest to us are such collective memories by the peoples and in the lands where the departures had actually taken place. We have already covered the evidence from the ancient Near East. It also comes from the Americas, and it embraces both Enlilite and Ancanite gods. In South America, the dominant deity was called Verscotia, creator of all. The Aymara natives of the Andes told of him that his adobe was in Tiawanku, and that he gave the first two brother-sister couple a golden wand which to find the right place to establish Cusco, the eventual Incan capital, the site for the observatory of Machu Picchu and other sacred sites. And then having done all that, he left. The grand layout which simulated a square ziggurat with its corners orientated to the cardinal points then marked the direction of his eventual departure. We have identified the god of Tiawanku as Teshub Adad of the Haiti or Sumerian pantheon and Lil's youngest son. In Mesoamerica, the giver of civilization was the winged serpent, Huatzalakult. We have identified him as Inki's son Toth of the Egyptian pantheon. Ningish Zeta to the Sumerians, and as the one who in 3113 BCE brought over his African followers to establish civilization in Mesoamerica, though the time of his departure was not specified, it had to coincide with the demise of his African prodigies, the Olmecs, and the simultaneous rise of the native Mayans circa 600-500 BCE. The dominant legend in Mesoamerica was his promise when he departed to return on the anniversary of his secret number, 52. And so it was by the middle of the first millennia BCE, in one part of the world after another, that mankind found itself without its long worship gods. And before long, the question, which has been asked by my readers, began to preoccupy mankind. Will they return? Like a family suddenly abandoned by its father, mankind grasped for the hope of a return. Then, like an orphan needing help, mankind cast about for a savior. The prophets promised it will surely happen at the end of days. At the peak of their presence, the Anunnaki numbered 600 on Earth, plus another 300 at Gigi based on Mars. Their number was falling after the deluge, and especially after Anu's visit circa 4000 BCE. Of the gods named in the early Sumerian text and in long god list, few remained as the millennia followed each other. Most returned to their home planet, some in spite of their wanted immortality, died on Earth. We can mention the defeat of Zu and Seth, the dismembered Osiris, and drowned Dimunzi, the nuclear-afflicted Bao. The departures of the Anunnaki gods as Nibiru's return loom were the dramatic finale. The awesome times when the gods resided in sacred precincts in the people's cities. When a pharaoh claimed that a god was riding along in his chariot, when an Assyrian king boasted of help from the skies, were over and gone. Already in the days of the prophet Jeremiah, the nations surrounding Judea were mocked for worshipping not a living god, but idols made by craftsmen of stone, wood, and metal, gods who needed to be carried, for they could not walk. With the final departure taking place, who of the great Anunnaki gods remained on earth? To judge by who was mentioned in the text and inscriptions from the ensuing period, we can be certain only of Marduk and Nabu of the Incanites, and of the Enlilites Ninar Sin, his spouse Ningol, and his aide Nusku, and probably also Ishtar. One on each side of the great religious divide, there was now just one sole great god of heaven and earth. Marduk for the Incanites, Nar Sin for the Enlilites. The story of Babylonia's last king reflected the new circumstances. He was chosen by Sin in the cult center Haran, but he required the consent and blessing of Marduk in Babylon, and the celestial confirmation by the appearance of Marduk's planet, and he bore the name Nabu Naid. This divine co reignium might have been an attempt at dual monotheism, to coin an expression, but its unintended consequences was to plant the seed of Islam. 
The historical record indicates that neither God nor people were happy with these arrangements. Sin, whose temple was Haran, was restored, demanded that this great ziggurat temple in Ur should also be rebuilt and become the center of worship. And in Babylon, the priests of Marduk were up in arms. A tablet, now in the British Museum, is inscribed with the text that scholars have titled Nabuenid and the Clergy of Babylon. It contains a list of accusations by Babylonian priests against Nabuenid. The charges ran from civil matters, law and order are not promulgated by him. Through neglect of the economy, the farmers are corrupted, the traders' roads are blocked, and lack of public safety, nobles are killed. To the most serious charges, religious sacrilege. He made an image of a god which nobody had seen before in the land. He placed it in the temple, raised it upon a pedestal. He called it by the name of Nanar. With lapis lazuli he adorned it, crowned it with a tiara in the shape of an eclipsed moon, made for him its hand the gesture of a demon. It was the accusations continued, a strange statue of a deity, never seen before, with hair reaching down to the pedestal. It was so unusual and unseemly, the priest wrote that even Inki and Ninma, who ended up with strange Chimara creatures when they attempted to fashion man, could not have conceived it. It was so strange that not even the learned Adapa, an icon of utmost human knowledge, could have named it. To make matters worse, two unusual beasts were sculpted as its guardians, one a deluge demon and the other a wild bull. When the king took his admiration and placed it in Marduk's Isagul temple, even more offending was Nabuad's announcement that henceforth the Akitu festival, during which the near-death resurrection, exile, and final triumph of Marduk were reenacted, would no longer be celebrated. Declaring that Nabuenned's protective god became hostile to him, and that the former favorite of the gods was now fated to misfortune, the Babylonian priests forced Nabuenned to leave Babylon and go into exile in a distant region. It is a historical fact that Nabuened indeed left Babylon and named his son Belshar Uzar, the Belshazzar of the biblical book Daniel, as regent. The distant region to which Nabuened went in self exile was Arabia. As various inscriptions attest, his entourage included Jews from among the Judean exiles in the Haran region. His principal base was at a place called Tiamma a caravan center in what is now northwestern Saudi Arabia that is mentioned several times in the Bible. Recent excavations there have uncovered cuneiform tablets attesting to Nabuendad's stay. He established six other settlements for his followers. Five of the towns were listed a thousand years later by Arabian writers as Jewish towns. One of them was Medina, the town where Muhammad founded Islam. The Jewish angel in the Nabuad tale has been reinforced by the fact that a fragment of the Dead Sea Scroll was found at Qumran on the shores of the Dead Sea, mentions Nabuad and asserts that he was suffering in Taima from an unpleasant skin disease that was cured only after a Jew told him to give honor to the God Most High. All that has led to speculation that Nabuad was contemplating monotheism but to him, the God Most High was not the Judea's Yahweh, but the benefactor Nanur Sin, the moon god, whose crescent symbol has been adopted by Islam. And there is little doubt that the roots can be tracked back to Nabuenad's stay in Arabia. Sin's whereabouts fade out of Mesopotamian records after the time of Nabuenad. Text discovered at Ugarit, a Canaanite site on the Mediterranean coast in Syria, now called Ras Shamra, described the moon god as retired, with his spouse to an oasis at the confluence of two bodies of water near the cleft of the two seas. Ever wondering why the Sinai Peninsula was named in honor of Sin and its main central crossroads? in honor of his spouse, Nikol. The place is still called in Arabic, Nikol. I surmise that the aged couple retired to somewhere on the shores of the Red Sea and the Gulf Eli. The Ugaritic texts called the moon god El, simply God. 
a forerunner of Islam's Allah, and his moon crescent symbol crowns every Muslim mosque. And as tradition demands, the mosques are flanked to this day by many rites that simulate multi-stage rocket ships ready to be launched. The last chapter in Nabu Adad's saga was linked to the emergence on the scene of the ancient world of the Persians, a name given to a medley of people and states in the Iranian plateau that included the old Sumerian Anshan and Elam, and the land of the later Medes, who had a land in the demise of Assyria. It was in the 6th century BCE that a tribe called Achaeans, by Greek historians who recorded their deeds, emerged from the northern outskirts of those territories, seized control, and unified them all to become a mighty new empire. Though deemed to racially be Indo-Europeans, these tribal names stem from that of their ancestor, Akam Anish, which means wise man in Semitic Hebrew a fact that some attribute to the influence of Jewish exiles from the ten tribes who had been relocated to the region by the Assyrians. Religiously, the Achaemenian Persians apparently adopted a Sumerian Akkadian pantheon akin to its Haran Mitannian version, which was a step from the Indo-Aryan, one of the Sanskrit Vedas, a mixture that is conveniently simplified by just stating that they believed in a god most high whom they called Ahura Mazda, truth and light. In 560 BCE, the Achaemenian king died and his son Koresh succeeded him on the throne and made his mark on subsequent historic events. We call him Cyrus. The Bible called him Koresh and considered him Yahweh's emissary for conquering Babylon, overthrowing its king, and rebuilding the destroyed temple in Jerusalem. Though you knowest me not, I, Yahweh, the God of Israel, am thy caller, who hath called you by name, who will help you, though you don't recognize me. The biblical God stated through the prophet Isaiah 44, 28 through 45, verses 1 through 4. That end of Babylonian kingship was most dramatically foretold in the book of Daniel. One of the Judean exiles taken to Babylon, Daniel was serving in the Babylonian court of the Belshazzar, when during a royal banquet a floating hand appeared and wrote on the wall mene mene tekel a parson astounded and mystified the king called his wizards and seers to decipher the inscription but none could as a last resort the exiled daniel was called in and he told the king the inscriptions meaning god has weighed babylon and its kings and finding them wanting numbered their days they will meet their end by the hand of the persians in 539 bce cyrus crossed the tigris river into babylonian territory advanced on sippar where he intercepted a rushing back nabuad and then claiming that Marduk himself had invited him, entered Babylon without a fight. Welcomed by the priest who considered him a savior from the heretic Nabuad and his disliked son Cyrus, grasps the hands of Marduk as a sign of homage to the god. But he also, in one of his very first proclamations, rescinded the exile of the Judeans, permitted the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, and ordered the return of all the temple's ritual objects that were looted by Nebuchadnezzar. The returning exiles under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah completed the rebuilding of the temple, henceforth known as the Second Temple in 516 BCE. Exactly as was prophesied by Jeremiah 70 years after the first temple was destroyed. The Bible considered Cyrus an instrument of God's plan, an anointed of Yahweh. Historians believe that Cyrus proclaimed a general religious amnesty that allowed each people to worship as they pleased as to what Cyrus himself might have believed to judge by the monument he had erected for himself, he appeared to have envisioned himself as a winged cherub. Cyrus, some historians attach the epitaph the Great to his name, consolidated into a vast Persian empire all the lands that had once been Sumar and Akkad, Marie and Matini, Haiti and Elam, Babylonia and Assyria, 
It was left to his son, Cambyses, to extend the empire to Egypt. Egypt was just recovering from a period of disarray that some considered a third intermediate period, during which it was disunited, changed capitals several times, was ruled by invaders from Nubia, or had no central authority at all. Egypt was also in disarray religiously, its priests uncertain who to worship, so much so that the leading cult was that of the dead Osiris, the leading deity, the female Neith, whose title was Mother of God, and the principal cult object, a bull, the sacred Apis bull, for whom elaborate funerals were held. Cambyses, too, like his father, was no religious zealot, and let people worship as they pleased. He even, according to an inscription, Stella, now in the Vatican Museum, learnt the secret of worship of Neith and participated in a ceremonial funeral of an Apis bull. These religious laissez-faire policies brought the Persians peace in their empire, but not forever. Unrest, uprising, and rebellions kept breaking out almost everywhere. Especially troublesome were growing commercial, cultural, and religious ties between Egypt and Greece. Much information about that comes from the Greek historian Herodotus, who wrote extensively about Egypt after his visit there in circa 460 BCE. Coinciding with the beginning of Greece's golden age, the Persians could not be pleased with those ties, above all because Greece mercenaries were participating in the local uprisings. Of particular concern were also the providences in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. At the western tip of which Asia and the Persians face Europe and the Greeks, there Greek settlers were reviving and reinforcing olden settlements. The Persians on their part sought to ward off the troublesome Europeans by seizing nearby Greek islands. The growing tensions broke into open warfare. When the Persians invaded the Greek mainland and were beaten at Marathon in 490 BCE, a Persian invasion by sea was beaten off by the Greeks in the Straits of Salamis a decade later. But the skirmishes and battles for control of Asia Minor continued for another century. Even as in Persia, king followed king, and in Greece, Athians, Spartans, and Macedonians fought one another for supremacy. In those double struggles, one among the mainland Greeks, of other with the Persians, the support of the Greek settlers of Asia Minor was very important. No sooner did the Macedonians win the upper hand on the mainland when their king, Philip II, sent an armed corpse over the straits of Hellespoint, today's Dardanelles. To secure the loyalty of the Greek settlements in 334 BCE, his successor Alexander the Great, heading an army 15,000 strong, crossed into Asia at the same place and launched a major war against the Persians. Alexander's astounding victories and the resulting subjugation of the ancient East-Western Greek domination have been told and retold by historians, starting with some who had accompanied Alexander and need no repetition here. What does need to be described are the personal reasons for Alexander's foray into Asia and Africa. For apart from all the geopolitical or economic reasons for the Greek-Persian Great War, there was Alexander's own personal quest. There had been persistent rumors in the Macedonian court that not King Philip, but a god, an Egyptian god, was Alexander's true father, having come to the queen's Olympians disguised as a man. With a Greek pantheon that derived from across the Mediterranean Sea and headed, like the Sumerian Twelve, by twelve Olympians, and with tales of the gods myth that emulated the Near Eastern tales of the gods, the appearance of one such god in the Macedonian court was not deemed an impossibility. With court shenanigans that involved a young Egyptian mistress of the king and marital strife that included divorce and murders, the rumors were believed first and foremost by Alexander himself. A visit by Alexander to the oracle in Delphi to find out whether he was indeed the son of a god and therefore immortal only intensified the mystery. He was advised to seek an answer at an Egyptian sacred site. It was thus that as soon as the Persians were beaten in the first battle, Alexander, rather than pursuing them, left his main army and rushed to the oasis of Siwa in Egypt. 
There a priest assured him that he indeed was a demigod, the son of the ram god, Amun. In celebration, Alexander issued silver coins showing him with ram's horns. But what about the immortality? While the course of the resumed warfare and Alexander's conquests have been documented by his campaign historians, Calisthians, and other historians, his personal quest for immortality is mostly known from sources deemed to be pseudo calisthians or Alexander's romances that embellished fact with legend. As detailed in the Stairway to Heaven, the Egyptian priest directed Alexander from Siwa to Thebes. There, on the Nile River's western shore, he could see in the funerary temple built by Hatshepsut the inscription attesting to her being fathered by the god Amun. When he came to her mother disguised as the royal husband, exactly like the tale of Alexander's demigod conception, in the great temple of Ra Amun the, in Thebes, in the Holy of Holies, Alexander was crowned as a pharaoh. Then, following the direction given in Siwa, he entered subterranean tunnels in the Sinai Peninsula, and finally he went to where Amun-Ra's allies Marduk, where Amun-Ra, alias Marduk, was, to Babylon. Resuming the battles with the Persians, Alexander reached Babylon in 331 BCE and entered the city riding in his chariot. In the sacred precinct, he rushed to the Isigal Ziggurat temple to grasp the hands of Marduk's as conquerors before him had done, but the great god was dead. According to the pseudo-sources, Alexander saw the god lying in a golden coffin, his body immersed or preserved in special oils. True or not, the facts are that Marduk was no longer alive and that his Isigal Ziggurat was without exception described as his tomb. By the subsequent established historians. According to Diodorus of Sicily, 1st century BCE, whose Bibliotheca Historica is known to have been compiled from verified reliable sources, scholars called Chaldeans, who have gained a great reputation in astrology and who are accustomed to predict future events by a method based on age-old observations warned Alexander that he would die in Babylon, but could escape the danger if he re-erected the tomb of Belus, which had been demolished by the Persians. Entering the city anyway, Alexander had neither the time nor manpower to do the repairs, and indeed died in Babylon in 323 BCE. The first century BCE historian geographer Strabo, who was born in a Greek town in Asia Minor, described Babylon in his famed geography, its great size, the hanging garden, that was one of the seven wonders of the world, its high buildings constructed of baked bricks, and so on, and said this in section 16I5. Here too is the tomb of Belus, now in ruins. Having been demolished by Xerxes, as it said, it was a quadrangular pyramid of baked bricks, not only being a stadium in height, but also having sides a stadium in length. Alexander intended to repair this pyramid, but it would have been a large task and would have required a long time so that he could not finish what he had attempted. According to this source, the tomb of Bel Marduk was destroyed by Xerxes, who was the Persian king and ruler of Babylon from 486 to 465 BCE. Strabo in Book 5 had earlier stated that Belus was lying in a coffin when Xerxes decided to destroy the temple in 482 BCE. Accordingly, Marduk died not long before. Germany's leading astrologist meeting at the University of Jena in 1922 concluded that Marduk was already in his tomb in 484 BCE. Marduk's son Nabu also vanished from the pages of history about the same time and thus came to an end, an almost human end, the saga of the gods who shaped history on planet Earth. That the end came as the age of the ram was waning was probably no coincidence either. With the death of Marduk and the fading away of Nabu, all the great Anunnaki gods who had once dominated Earth were gone. With the death of Alexander and the real or 
pretended demigods who linked mankind to gods were also gone. For the first time since Adam was fashioned, man was without his creators. In those despondent times for mankind, hope came forth from Jerusalem. Amazingly, the story of Marduk and his ultimate fate in Babylon had been correctly foretold in biblical prophecies. We have already noted that Jeremiah, while forecasting a crushing end for Babylon, made the distinction that its god Bel, Marduk, was only doomed to wither, to remain, but to grow old and confused, to shrivel and die. We should not be surprised that it was a prophecy that came true. But as Jeremiah correctly predicted, the final downfall of Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon, he accompanied those predictions with prophecies of a reestablished Zion, of a rebuilt temple, and of a happy end for all nations at the end of days. It would be, he said, a future that God had planned in his heart all along, a secret that shall be revealed to mankind at a predetermined future time. At the end of days, you shall perceive it. And at that time, they shall call Jerusalem Yahweh's throne, and all nations shall assemble there. Isaiah, in his second set of prophecies, sometime called the second Isaiah, identified Babylon's God as the hiding God, which is what Ammon meant foresaw the future in those words. Bel is bowed down. Nebu is coward. Their images are loads of beasts and cattle. Together they stoopeth, they bow down, unable to save themselves from capture. These prophecies, as did Jeremiah, also contain the promise that Marduk will be offered a new beginning, new hope, that a messianic time will come when the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the prophet said, It shall come to pass at the end of days that the mount of Yahweh's temple shall be established as foremost of all mountains, exalted above all hills, and all the nations shall throng unto it. It will be then that the nations shall beat their swords into plugshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation and they shall no longer teach war. The assertion that after troubles and tribulations, after people and nations shall be judged for their sins and transgressions, a time of peace and justice shall come, was also made by the earlier prophets, even as they predicted the days of the Lord as judgment day. Among them were Hosea, who foresaw the return of the kingdom of God through the house of David at the end of days, and Micah, who, using words identical to those of Isaiah, declared that at the end of days it shall come to pass. Significantly, Micah, too, considered the restoration of the God's temple in Jerusalem and Yahweh's universal reign through a descendant of David as a prerequisite, a must, destined from the very beginning, emanating from the ancient times, from everlasting days. There was thus a combination of two basic elements in those end-of-days predictions. One, that the day of the Lord and the day of judgment upon earth and the nations will be followed by restoration, renewal, and a benevolent era centered on Jerusalem. The other is that it has all been preordained, that the end was already planned by God at the beginning. Indeed, the concept of an end of epic, a time when the course of events shall come to a halt, a persecutor, one may say, of the current idea of the end of history, and a new epic, one is almost tempted to say a new age, a new and predicted cycle shall begin, can already be found in the earliest biblical chapters. The Hebrew term atret hayamim, sometimes translated last days, latter days, but more accurately end of days, was already used in the Bible in Genesis chapter 49, when the dying Jacob summoned his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you at the end of days. It is a statement followed by detailed predictions that many associate with the twelve houses of the zodiac that presupposes prophecy by being based on advanced knowledge of the future. And again in Deuteronomy chapter 4, when Moses, before dying, reviewing Israel's divine legacy and its fortune, counseled the people thus, When you in tribulations shall be, and such things shall befall you in the end of days, to Yahweh thy God return and hearken to his voice. 
the repeated stress on the role of Jerusalem on the essentiality of its Temple Mount as the beacon to which all nations shall come streaming had before then a theological moral reason, a very practical reason is cited. The need to have the site ready for the return of Yahweh Kavad, the very term used in Exodus, and then by Ezekiel to describe God's celestial vehicle, the Kavad, that will be enshrined in the rebuilt temple from which I shall grant peace, shall be greater than the one in the first temple, the prophet Hagi was told. Significantly, the Kavad's coming to Jerusalem was repeatedly linked in Isaiah to the other space-related site in Lebanon. It is from there that the god Kavad shall arrive in Jerusalem. One cannot avoid the conclusion that a divine return was expected at the end of days. But when was the end of days due? The question, one to which we shall offer our own answer, is not anew, for it has already been asked in antiquity, even by the very prophets who had spoken of the end of days. Isaiah's prophecy about the time when a great trumpet shall be blown and the nations shall gather and bow down to Yahweh on the holy mount in Jerusalem was accompanied by his admissions that without details and timing, the people could not understand the prophecy. Percept is upon percept. Percept is within percept. Line is upon line. Line is with line. A little here, somewhat there, was how Isaiah complained to God. Whatever answer he was given, he was ordered to seal and hide the document. No less than three times Isaiah changed the word for letters of the script. Odiath to Ototh, which meant oracle signs, hinting at the existence of a kind of secret Bible code due to which the divine plan could not be comprehended until the right time. Its secret code might have been hinted at when the prophet asked God, identified as creator of the letters, to tell us the letters backwards. The prophet Zephaniah, whose very name meant by Yahweh encoded, relayed a message from God that it will be at the time of the nations gathering that he will speak in a clear language, but that said no more than saying, you will know when it will be time to tell. No wonder then that in its final prophetic book, the Bible dealt mostly exclusively with the question of when. When will the end of days come? In the book of Daniel, the very Daniel who deciphered correctly the Belshazzar, the writing on the wall, it was after that that Daniel himself begun to have omen dreams and see apocalyptic visions of the future in which the ancient days and his archangels played key roles. Perplexed, Daniel asked the angels for explanations. The answers consisted of predictions of future events taking place at or leading to the end of time. And when will that be, Daniel asked. The answers which on the face of it seem precise only piled up enigmas upon puzzles. In one instance, an angel answered that a phase in future events, a time when an holy king shall try to change the times and the laws, will last a time, times, and a half time. Only after that will the promised messianic time, when the kingdom of heaven shall be given to the people by the holy ones of the Most High, come about. Another time, the responding angel said, 77s and 76s of years have been decreed for your people and your city until the measure of transgression is filled and prophetic vision is ratified. And yet another time that after the 70s and 60s and two of years, the Messiah will be cut off, a leader will come who will destroy the city, and the end will come through a flood. Seeking a clear answer, Daniel then asked a divine messenger to speak plainly, how long until the end of these awful things? In response, he then received the enigmatic answer that the end will come after a time, times, and a half time. But what did time, times, and a half time mean? What did 70 weeks of years mean? 
I heard it and did not understand, Daniel stated in his book. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these things? Again, speaking in codes, the angel answered, from the time the regular offering is abolished and an appalling abomination is set up, it will be a thousand and two hundred and ninety days. Happy is the one who waits and reaches one thousand three hundred and thirty five. And having given Daniel that information, the angel who had called him before son of man told him, now go on to thy end and arise for your destiny at the end of days. Like Daniel, generations of biblical scholars, savants and theologians, astrologers and even astronomers, the famed Sir Isaac Newton among the latter, who said, we heard but did not understand. The enigma is not just the meaning of time, time and a half, and so on, but from when does or did the count begin? The uncertainty stems from the fact that the symbolic visions seen by Daniel, such as a goat attacking a ram, or two horns multiplying to four and then dividing, were explained to him by the angels as events that were to take place well beyond Babylon of Daniel's time beyond its predicted fall, even beyond the prophesied rebuilding of the temple after 70 years, the rise and demise of the Persian Empire, the coming of Greeks under Alexander's leadership, even the division of his conquered empire among his successors, all are foretold with such accuracy that many scholars believe that the Daniel prophecies are of the post-event genre that the book's prophetic part was actually written circa 250 BCE, but pretended to have been written three centuries earlier. The clinching argument is the reference in one of the angelic encounters to the start of the count from the time that regular offering in the temple is abolished and an appalling abomination is set up that could only refer to the events that took place in Jerusalem on the 25th day of the Hebrew month Kislev in 167 BCE. The date is precisely recorded for it was then that the abomination of desolation was placed in the temple, making many then believe the start of the end of days.